guys, can you tell me a little bit about the overall overall spirit of the Toronto Titans when you first arrived? Because you guys were a rookie team surrounded by teams that already had ISL experience. How was it? And you guys have arrived a little later. Did you guys feel a little bit alienated in a way or did it kind of swallow you straight away? Um, Luis, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I thought we had a great team atmosphere and like I wasn't part of the first season of the ISL. So I had like no expectations. Didn't really know what it was going to be about. Uh, all I've heard was like great team atmosphere and coming straight out of college, like, Yes, getting into a new team was really exciting. Um, and getting there a week later, honestly, I think that was an advantage for us. Because uh, I've heard, like, we heard from people, we knew people in other teams, so we heard what they had to go through. And I felt like we probably were just more prepared for what to expect when we got there. But yeah, no, in terms of the team, like, it was so fun being part of a new team. And, like, we could actually, like, set the culture that we wanted. And yeah, no, the managers on our team did a great job putting together our team you guys missed the internet struggle we don't have an internet for the first couple of days <laughs> i was running around putting rotors in the hotel <laughs> but by the time you guys arrived we were set <laughs> um anton um what about you um how, how was the toronto titans atmosphere for you when you first came in do you agree with Luis that it kind of benefited you guys if you were you came in a, a week later yeah no i mean so you know, new team, uh, also a lot of people that weren't a part of ISL for the first season. Um, obviously, had some veterans who were a part of season one, but, you know, having that new team allowed us to create our own team identity. And I think our captains, uh, Kylie and Brent, did an awesome job of that. And then as well, it goes for the management of, you know, just recruiting people who seem to have a, you know, always team spirit first attitude. And I think that definitely showed um, just by how quickly we were able to come together and uh, fight as a team. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. And Tessa, what about you? Yeah, I think um, I think we had a great team. And I think, like Louise said, coming in a week later was actually like an advantage for us because we got to kind of see how things were rolling, especially for the first few meets. For me personally, this was my first season of ISL. And so kind of seeing how everything was starting to run, um, it got me more excited to go and like be a part of it myself. And I think um, there's a bunch of people on our team that were like just as excited to hit the ground running and kind of um, go in to our first meet with a bang and show just what kind of a team the Toronto team had. Of course. You guys must have been all hungry for competition, right? You haven't competed in quite a while, all of you. When was the last time you competed before the ISL? Like the last official meet was probably our conference in February for me. Hmm. Same for you guys. That that's March is March, I'm assuming. I was yeah. lucky with the uh, COVID situation in Iceland. We had a couple of meets, but it wasn't anything where I had prepared myself to go any uh, crazy times. It's more train through. But you know, luckily, I was able to have some some racing experience. Yeah, my last my last swim meet was um, like middle of February, so it was a long time. <laughs> Did you guys feel the the sort of you know, when you don't compete for a while and you kind of have to roll into it little by little. I mean, Louise, especially for you, it looked like your first match, you were still kind of rolling into it. And then your second match, you kind of hit your groove, right? Yeah, no, I definitely felt a little race rusty the first mate, just like getting into it and like definitely a lot more nerves than it usually are in the mate, just like building up to it, being so excited to get into it. But yeah, definitely got better the more races I did. Anton, Tessa, how was it for you? R race rusty as well? Um, I would say a little bit for me. Um, obviously not swimming for so many months. You're going to feel, you kind of forget how racing feels. <laughs> um, but for me, honestly, coming into the meets, um, I didn't really have an expectation for the first few meets at least. I personally haven't swum short course meters in like a few years even being from Canada, I grew up swimming short course meters, but um, swimming uh, university in the States, all we did was yards. So it was kind of fun. I was like, this is a new kind of experience for me swimming meters again. Also coming off of a long break, I was really excited. I just definitely wanted to see how close I would be to my best times or if I would even like be way under. So it was really exciting. And I just 
for the first meets, I definitely just wanted to kind of get a gauge on how everything was going to go. Okay, okay. Thank you, Tessa. Um, theoretically, in my mind, it makes sense that, um, especially the events you swim, the 200 and the 400 medley, that back to breast turn must be so difficult coming from yards and long course meters to short course meters to perfectly time this. But yet looking at your results, starting from match three was your guys' first match and ending in semifinal two, your results were incredibly stable. It didn't seem like you had a decline or improvement as to say. Did you kind of hit that turn straight away perfectly or? Um, yeah, honestly, the past year I've been working a lot um, on the back to breast turn specifically. Um, I've only kind of picked it up in the past few years. So I was trying to perfect it before coming and putting it on the international stage. But no, I think it honestly is fine. I think it's definitely helped having the meters background, like growing up before college. I'm definitely comfortable doing um, like timing my walls and everything. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, overall, I'm really happy with how kind of stable and like consistent all of my races have were for like all five meets that we did. Um, it was really fun. I was definitely like focusing on different elements of the race in each meet that we did. And it was kind of cool to see that I would get almost the same time or like a little bit off here and there. So it was definitely great to learn from, to see what worked well and what kind of needed to change race from like race to race. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. And Anton, what about you? You had a bit of a journey with your times as to say throughout the season. It seemed like, um, for example, match six was absolutely amazing for you, but you guys had a tough double match six to match seven. And it seemed like you struggled quite a bit in match seven. Was it, was it the accumulated fatigue? Um, was the match six so perfect for you because of the rate race rust as to say in the first match? Yeah. I mean, I was going to say just like not having raced at a high stage like that, um, you know, for a, for a couple of months coming in, having no expectations, um, it sort of allowed myself to just sort of go out there and um, redefine my standards. Um, and so definitely my first two matches um, and obviously coming in, you know, fully focused on just hitting the ground running, um, you know, really hit those uh, first two meets well. Um, and then I'm not sure if I just got into my head too much, but obviously a little bit of fatigue as well. Um, but it was a new type of experience. Um, you know, uh, usually the, the amount of time that you want to have yourself in a, you know, peak race ready, ready fitness is not this long. And so it was just a first time for me. And so my main takeaway from all this is just, you know, the race experience. And so I'll definitely, uh, you know, tweak a couple things to be more ready for, uh, for season two at three. Mm -hmm. Of course. Can we see any any new events from you guys coming into season three? Um, Anton, maybe the 100 I am for you? Um, oh, no, absolutely not. No, still focus on the 200 and the 100. <laughs> okay, okay. Tessa, what about you? You were ex incredibly stable. 200 I am, 200 fly, 400 I am in all of the meets. Any, any new meets we might expect? Any new events we might expect from you? Maybe the 400 freestyle? Um. I mean, I'm always open to trying new things and definitely I'm 100% willing to do anything that whatever the team needs me to do. So um, I think it helps being able to like being a 400 diameter, I can kind of switch back and forth when needed. So I'm definitely, I'm open to anything if they need me. What do you think about the new event, the 800 freestyle? Um, I think, I think uh, it's, a great opportunity for more distance swimmers. I know like ISL, kind of the whole ISL is very much oriented to sprint events. And so I think it's a great opportunity that they're giving to more distance swimmers. Um, and I think, I mean, personally being kind of a distance swimmer myself, I find it exciting. <laughs> I know a lot of sprinters don't really find it exciting, but I think it's a great, um, kind of extra opportunity for them come on it, it has to be interesting for the sprinters also it's it's such so interesting to see a teammate sprinter sprint the first 200 and then die for the for the remaining 600 it's entertaining yeah it's definitely interesting <laughs>
Luis, what about you? Can we expect any new events from you coming into the next season? Maybe some more backstroke? I don't know. <laughs> Same as this. Well, like, I am open. Like, if the team needs me to swim a certain distance, like, I'm totally fine with it. I, I'm pretty versatile. Like, I can do some fly back and freestyle. So, wherever the team needs me, I know they were talking about maybe doing some sprint free events. It's been talking about the two fly since I did it a bunch in college, but <laughs> not my favorite distance. <laughs> but we had such an amazing backstrokers on the team this year. So, they did a great job doing it. And I'm happy just taking to the fly and freestyle, but I'm open to wherever the team needs me. Please, does the two fly take a little bit too much out of you? Do you have trouble swimming any events after? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a mental struggle. It's a long event for a sprint flyer. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I can definitely understand that. Okay, guys, um, next question. I kind of want to generalize it a little bit. Um, what do you think of the performance of the Toronto Titans as a rookie team in, in, in their first season? I mean, from one point of view, you guys, from my point of view, you guys did amazing. You made it for, to the semifinals um, for a rookie team. I, I believe that's great. And you guys were competitive. At no point was a, a free pass for any of the teams against you. But I'm assuming, um, especially the high caliber athletes you guys are, you always strive for the best to be the best. So do you guys have any remorse of not making it to the final, maybe? Um, Anton, do you want to start? No, I think, you know, we really, I mean, coming in, obviously we knew we had a strong roster, but we hadn't swum together as a team. And I think we definitely, at least in my view, I, uh, you know, I think we definitely exceeded our, our expectations. You know, it was our goal to get into the, get into the semifinal and then give it all we had when we got there. Um, you know, obviously we're all, we all want to win. And so it, was, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't fun making it to the uh, final stage, but I think that's just gonna be something that we take into season three and, you know, come back even stronger. Um, so I think overall, you know, just as a, you know, first time team, I think, I think we're all pretty happy with, uh, with where we ended up and the results that we got. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so you think that altogether the season was quite satisfying for the Toronto Titans? From my point of view, it definitely was. Um, and just, you know, like I said, motivated us to come even more hungry into the next season. Okay, thank you, Anton. Tessa, what about you? Yeah, I am really proud of what the Toronto Titans were able to do. I think, um, I think we all came in there obviously a little nervous, uh, not really knowing... Uh, kind of where we stood being the new team and everything but I think we really didn't let that get into our heads very much and I think um, as the meets were able to go on we got way more comfortable and we got like with each other and with swimming again and so we were able to build off of every single swim that we were able to do and so many people were going best time so many records were being broken and so we were kind of using the momentum from the past meet and growing stronger as a team each time we were able to race. And I think making the semifinals um, was a really big step for us, um, kind of putting our name as a team on kind of that whole international stage. So um, I think we did a really good job about proving what the, a new team is capable of. For sure. Yeah, the Tokyo Falcon is also, you guys, you guys did amazing for, for rookie teams, I agree. Luis, what do you think about this? What, what is your take? I agree with Anton and Tess. Um, we had as a goal to make into the semifinal. We were a new team and like just building the team from the ground and getting excited for each other. Like we got better every, every meet and we were super competitive and just knowing going into season three that we have the foundation of the team now I feel like that can just make us stronger but in general like I agree with everything they say is making the final semi-final that was the goal and we made it and yeah <laughs> I think we surprised did, a few people when you guys made the semi-final did it feel like goal accomplished um I don't know mission complete um no matter what that happens now you guys are happy or or were you still competitive and ready to go for the semi-final hoping to make it to the final please. <laughs> <laughs> um, we knew it was going to be tough making the final. Like there were really strong teams in there, um, but we were just trying to make, take every race as it comes, build a lot of momentum, 
we had some really great swims in there and just trying to steal as many points as we could from the other teams. But having the expectation of making the final, I think was maybe not fair, but you just wanted to really fight for it. Like give it our best, like trying to climb up like for the fifth, sixth, seventh spot as well. Like every spot counts. Okay. Thank you, Louise. And guys, if you're okay, let's go for the first round of five questions. Um, Anton, what is your most memorable, memorable event, most memorable race out of all the multiple races you've done and why? Uh, it would have to be without doubt the first 200 breaststroke that I had. And so I forget what match that was overall, but the first match for us and, um, you know, just coming to the wall and seeing how excited everyone was in the in the team box um that was something that was really special um you know seeing that one i was able to give you know that energy to the team and you know and, and they were celebrating for me as well and so that definitely gave me you know you know told me that the toronto titans was the uh, you know the place and the team that i that i wanted to be at and also just gave me the mo motivation to uh continue to try to get those first pl uh, first place placements because, you know, seeing my team that excited and, and hyped up was a, uh, yeah, memory that I'll never forget. That was such an important race for the Toronto Titans also to, to start everything off. I mean, Luis, you were responsible for the first W of the Toronto Titans as a team altogether, but Anton, you had, you had the second, the second W of Toronto Titans ever. <laughs> so it's a big race. I agree. And just, just another question from the fans and, um, I'm not quite aware of this, but I'm assuming you know what they're referring to. When is the next 300 for time, 3,000 for time? Oh, goodness. That was when we, uh, in college, uh, our, our head coach, Dennis Persley, always used to make us do 3,000 for time. Um, and me having a distance, distance event background, it was always a, a favorite for me. But uh, hopefully, hopefully never again. I think those days are, uh, you know, past me and uh, a little more breaststroke focused training now <laughs> you know we used to do 3,000 and 4,000 times and yeah wow, it's, it's quite a miserable thing to do um, especially short course <laughs> for sure thank you Anton and Luis um, what events do you hope to qualify for for Tokyo 2021 uh, I'm already selected for the 100 fly, and that is my main event. Um, as of right now, I it's relays that also the events I want to swim. Obviously, I want to be up there, maybe fighting for a spot in the 100 free, but I know it's very competitive having both Michelle and Sarah ahead of me. But the relays and 100 fly is like my main focus. Uh, the Swedish team is going to be pretty much unstoppable in the relays now that I think about it. I mean, obviously, the Americans are going to be there. Um, Canadians are always game, um, Australians, but you guys are going to be in the mix. It's going to be interesting to see. And um, one more question, Luis. What was your favorite food while living in LA? When? While living in LA. LA? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> um, favorite food? There is a lot of great food places. Me and my roommates have a very soft spot for donuts though. So <laughs> we always went to this little donut place. That was like our little treat. American donuts are special, I agree. Thank you, Louise. Yeah. <laughs> Tessa, and for you, um, what are your goals for 2021? Um, my goals for the rest of this year, um, I was definitely focused on our Olympic trials. We have, our trials just got postponed to the end of May. So that gives us seven more weeks of good training. And yeah, I'm excited. I, I'm, I left training at school. I'm back home training in Canada now. I just wanted to kind of be able to relax and not have to worry about traveling to like too close to trials. And so now I'm kind of set um, in my training position and I'm, I'm really excited. I think I, I definitely have big goals for myself, but I know that I'm definitely capable of doing it, um, especially having the experience and confidence coming from ISL. I definitely want to see if I can put my name on an Olympic team for the first time. I think that would be a really exciting thing to do. Thank you, Tessa. Tessa, another question. Um, you, you had very difficult um, 
I sell days 200, I am 200, fly 400, I am that, that is tough. One of, one of our fans want to know, wants to know, is there any snack you take before such a day that will help you run through the entire meet? What do you snack after each event or something like this? How do you maintain energy? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely taken me a lot of practice to kind of find what works with my stomach and not feel too heavy or kind of run out of energy. But honestly, I, for days that I have um, back-to-back events or a few like really hard events, I always make sure I have like a Gatorade or like an electrolyte kind of drink to sip on throughout the whole session so that I kind of don't get too like drained. And then also I like to have just like a small, like an applesauce or something that'll like a quick kind of sugary carb kind of snack, like 20 minutes before I swim. I think that that's enough that gets me kind of going and can last throughout the few races that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Have you ever tried Vitargo? Um, no, I don't. I don't know what that is. Maybe you should. It's, it's like an upgraded version of Gatorade. So oh, it's okay. Cool. <laughs> I will check that out. <laughs> Thank you, Tessa. And um, Louise, Tessa, you mentioned um, the Olympic Games and your responses, and I kind of want to um, shift our focus to the Olympic Games a little bit. Could we take a trip down memory lane and remember what was the events happening with you specifically during spring of 2020 when the information came out that the Olympics were postponed? Um, how was your motivation and how was your mental state at, at this specific moment? Uh, Luis, you want to start? It was a really tough time for me, to be honest. I really struggled. Uh, a lot happened within a week. Um, NCAA got cancelled and then Olympic got cancelled and then graduation got postponed. And within this week of all the craziness happening, I had to leave LA Um without like no notice so I got like basically 24 hours to pack up my life for four years to send a plane back home so it was a really tough week and it took me a while to get through it um, and obviously like Olympic and getting cancelled and everything that was the right decision and kind of easy to deal with compared to like leaving everything so quickly and there was just so much happening um, but it was postponed so you know there was a greater chance. Hopefully it's happening this year. Um, but something you've trained for four years, like obviously going to take a big hit when it gets canceled or moved so close. Yeah, always. I had to leave California within 24 hour notice also. It was quite a change in, 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 yeah. in my life. Louise, were you able to come back to LA since? No, I haven't. <laughs> All my stuff are still there. <laughs> oh, wow. Same for me. <laughs> um, did you did you um, did you train straight after straight after the news came out, or did you take some time off, you know, to to re to reassess yourself and your values? So I was lucky because Sweden never closed down. Like I would say, as of right now, this is like the most on lockdown Sweden have been. So I was able to train through all summer, and I would actually say that swimming was able to just help me get through these tough times. Like coming to the pool I feel like when I dive into water I try to let everything else go then it's just like I'm present I'm doing what I'm doing in the water and trying to just leave everything behind so I would actually say that swimming like really helped me get through like all the changes that was happening in my life at the time. Thank you thank you Louise. Tessa I saw you nodding was it was it the same for you the swimming was sort of the savior from the situation in a way? Yeah I definitely agree and I, I feel the same way kind of to everything um when we got the news that was like louise like right after our uh school conference meet and for my team um we were coming off from a win and we were coming off from a really big high so at first it was like okay whoa like what do we do like this is completely the wrong direction that we need to like be going in um but and then also i had to go home like within the week of hearing everything i traveled back home um and then I was out of the water for a good five six months um but honestly I think having that time out of the water it really helped me to just um 
kind of like slow everything down and like process everything that was happening. Um, like I was able to just like sit down and like reflect on everything that had happened my senior year in school and kind of take um, all the good things and all the bad things and kind of like really um, process everything that had happened. Um, I think it was would have been great to continue doing meets off that high from our win at conference, but I think it was also a good um, time. Like it kind of like forced me to take a step back, but I think it was really good because when you go through something that exciting, sometimes you need to just relax a bit afterwards. And so I think for me, the first little bit, um, it definitely helped me just stay calm and kind of um, reevaluate on how everything was doing. And then it also gave me a few months to kind of reassess my goals, um, kind of plan out how the next year would go um, rather than the next like few months that were supposed to be for trials, like how the next year until trials would go. Um, so I think it, I think it was good for the mental kind of preparation and like planning part of the next year. It was definitely frustrating at times not being able to do anything. Um, but, um, yeah, I think honestly, I'm kind of grateful for a, a little bit of a time off. It, it definitely helped me just relax uh, mentally a bit. What about physically? Did you feel like you were overworked a little bit before? Because I know it's an over recurring theme with a lot of swimmers that that little break they receive and all of a sudden their body recovers. And they, Honestly, they yes. <laughs> um, I, I was definitely trying to stay as fit as possible, but I think it was a good kind of break from that like high intensity training. Um, definitely keeping general strength and general like flexibility was super important to kind of be able to bounce back as fast as you could when you were able to get back in the water. But it was definitely a good time to let your body kind of come down and um, really focus on what you might have been looking over like in practice, like for me, I was able to do a lot of like land activities and dry land and in my weight sessions that I either didn't have the chance to do or wasn't focusing on a lot while I was swimming. So it was kind of, it was kind of a good opportunity to just try new things and see what would help when I would get back in the water. Makes sense. Thank you, Tessa. And yeah, we, I, I spoke to a bunch of athletes before and a lot of them um, voiced their opinion that this this break they received a couple of weeks to a couple of months was hugely beneficial to their swimming career, both mentally and physically. And I, I actually spoke with Vlad Morris of recently, and he had the ability to train after the news came out that Olympics were going to be postponed. But he decided to take a couple of months off by himself, and he thought that was hugely beneficial to his swimming career. So maybe it works out. <laughs> Maybe it's something that everyone is going to start doing, taking taking a month or two off every season. <laughs> Anton, what about you? Um, uh, how did the news strike you when you found out? And um, what did you do after? Yeah, so I was training in Virginia at the time. Um, and then I had to sort of – our pool closed down here in Virginia. Um, and Iceland, the country itself, was about to go on lockdown. And so I decided to – go home before that would happen. Um, and I think the Olympics were in, I'm not sure if they were canceled by then, but you know, COVID was obviously affecting everything. And it was really just hard going from sort of the championship mindset. You have to put yourself into, you know, with the months leading up to the Olympics, um, instead of going from that into, all right, you just gotta make it through these next couple, couple of months. Like the goal is not to, you know, succeed or, or um, you know, perform at a high level, but just to maintain and somehow make it through. So it was, it was hard to, you know, change that, um, having that mental switch. Um, but, you know, thankfully Iceland only had, I think I was out of the pool for only three weeks. And so, you know, during that time, um, also fortunate, uh, looking at it in, in, in hindsight, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the time that I was able to, um, first of all, spend time with family. And then also with me being in a little unique situation, I can use all the time I can get to, you know, I wouldn't say catch up, but just make sure that I'm adequately prepared um, due to my little uh, 
work stint after after college and so any any extra time that i'm allotted to train and uh this is a bonus for me so like <laughs> having the olympus cancel would probably be, like the best thing ever that could have happened to my you know you know chances of you know succeeding in the olympics if they happen this year uh having that extra year to train thank you thank you anton um guys i'm um, looking into olympics of 2021 um, how confident do you actually feel that they're going to happen? And, um, and another question is, do you guys have any health concerns coming into these Olympics for your own health? And did you have similar self concerns coming into the ISL? Um, Tessa, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, to the question of if the Olympics are going to happen, um, how I'm viewing it is whether it happens or not is completely out of my control. And so I'm, I'm hoping that it does. Obviously, I'm hoping everything is able to run smoothly, but I, and I'm gonna prepare myself for them to run smoothly, um, but I'm just gonna hope for the best, see, see what happens. It's not, I, I can't, nothing that I'm gonna do is change, um, is going to change the outcome of the Olympics. So I'm just gonna prepare as if, everything is going to run smoothly. Um, and honestly, I was really happy with how ISL handled everything with COVID and every kind of health measure that they took. Um, I felt really safe during the whole trip. Honestly, I was a bit, I was a bit nervous coming in because I, I didn't really know what to expect. And uh, they were obviously like sharing all their protocols with us and a lot of sharing a lot of like health um, documents for us to kind of prepare ourselves and get familiar with before. But I was, I was a little bit nervous, so I'm not gonna lie. Um, but when I got there and I actually saw them like in person, um, cleaning all the time and like being very strict on separating everything, mm -hmm. I felt really safe. And so I think that was kind of a good trial run in a sense. Um, it was very small scale to, compare what the Olympics would be like, but if they were able to keep um, the 500 plus people that were in ISL safe for the whole six weeks, then I think they can definitely um, kind of take the same approach to having the Olympics um, and kind of make it work for a larger scale for a little bit longer period of time. Hopefully, hopefully, right? That's, that's tens of thousands of people. That's, that's another yeah. scale though. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Tessa. Um, Anton, what about you? Um, how confident are you in the upcoming Olympics? Um, any health concerns? Maybe they're similar to the ones you had coming into the ISL. By the way, Tessa, I got absolutely terrified when I when I saw the 50-something health protocol. I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to follow this, <laughs> but it, it'll work out fine. <laughs> yeah, no, um, obviously, I agree with Tessa 100%. You know, it's completely out of the athlete's control. And the only thing that we can do to, you know, prepare is sort of, you know, hope for the best and, and prepare for the worst. But I wouldn't say that I have. So obviously I trusted, you know, the health protocols that the ISL um, had. And I believe that, you know, the Olympic Committee and, um, you know, the government of Japan will make the decision that's going to work best for everyone, um, both the public in Japan and also the athletes. Um, so whatever the decision will be made, I'm, I'm sure that they have thought through every single scenario um, to keep everyone's health in check. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my trust into, into their hands and just sort of, sort of go with the flow on this. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's the only thing that we can do in these uncertain times. Do you wish at all that they were a bit more um, open in, in terms of health protocol, in terms of how's it all going? Or... Well, I mean, there's a lot riding on the line and um, completely understand that they're going to, you know, work their best, you know, until they would make any public um, announcements of, you know, what's going to happen or not. So you just got to, you just got to be patient and uh, sort of, you know, keep your horse blinders on and just keep training. Uh, that's at least what I'm trying to do right now. You. Thank you, Anton. And Luis, what about you? Um, what's your take I on agree. This? It's like okay. we have nothing 
we can't control it. I'm preparing for the Olympics to happen. I feel like it's better to be prepared for it to happen and not come there and be like, what? <laughs> and I'm not ready for it. So I'm just, I'm just doing all the preparations I had planned to do for last year. Um, and in terms of like ISL, like being so successful with like the protocol and everything, like that definitely made me more open to like, okay, Olympics might actually happen. Like we were able to run through this meet and other sports leagues have been able to go into bubbles and uh, be able to like do their games as well. Um, obviously like as Anton, like there will be a health protocol and hopefully that's going to be covering Japan and the athletes and everyone involved um so yeah I it's gonna be a different year it's not gonna be like 2016 Olympic it's definitely gonna look differently if it's happened but fingers crossed it happens thank you Anton I wanted to ask you a question regarding a situation that happened um in between uh, in the middle of the ISL bubble Mel Marshall went to social media talking about the breaststroke technique of Ilya Shimanovich, saying that he does an extra fly kick into the wall and it is illegal to do. First of all, what is your take on this situation? Which side do you take, if you take a side? I mean, I'd take the side of the FINA rules and then I guess it's up to all the swimmers to interpret that in the way that they, you know, think they're swimming legally. Okay. Talking about the FINA rules, do you feel like uh, something should change? Because there seems to be a lot of, I don't know, things up in the air regarding breaststroke. I mean, officials can't really see the second kick on the water off of each wall. Then you're looking at swimmers like Ilya Shimanovich or Molly Hannes from above. It, it, to me, personally, it seems like they're a dolphin kicking. But when you see the underwater footage, no, they're not doing anything, anything remotely um, as dolphin kicking, they don't do the down kick at all. Do you feel like any rule changes should be made? I mean, I think just in general, having a underwater camera would eliminate all uh, all doubt. And so, you know, I'm not saying, well, as long as it wouldn't interfere with the way the process of, you know, the swimming meets are held, um, I wouldn't want a long delay in, in schedule due to some officiating having to... Um, having to happen. So as long as it can be a, you know, seamless and uh, fluid process, I think, I think it wouldn't, I think it wouldn't hurt the sport of swimming and it would eliminate all doubts and everyone would have a, you know, fair and level playing field. Yeah, this is something Ilya Shimanovich also said. He, he, he's a big supporter of the underwater cameras to, to release all the tension and release all the misunderstandings that exist. And exactly. last, last question regarding breaststroke technique. Do you feel like this narrow kick that now Ilya Shimanovich is introducing, Molly Hannes, Cody Miller is another guy, do you feel like this is the new say in breaststroke technique in general and the new revolution in breaststroke that is happening right now, that narrow kick? Um, it, it's certainly an argument for that within the shorter distance events and especially then within short course as well. And so the 50 and the 100, um, but I think, especially like for the event that I focus on the 200, um, I'm not necessarily sure that this would be, you know, because it, 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 it forces you to have a high turnover rate. Um, and especially with the 200, you want to keep your distance for stroke. So I think that at least something that I'm not going to pick up in training since my main event is the is the 200. Now, this is something that I would, you know, then look into for the 100 or the 50, maybe. But at least for now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to my technique because it uh, got me this far. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Tessa, a question to you. Um, you are a relatively young swimmer, yet you were facing some, some of the world's um, biggest swim stars in some of your events, just Katinka Hosu to make one. How um, important was it for your confidence in general to be able to hold, hold off these swimmers and receive wins on some of these events you were swimming in, a, in an incredibly um, competitive field? Yeah. I honestly, I'm, I am really proud of myself on how I was able to um, keep my confidence up and my kind of um, keeping myself very relaxed and focused throughout of all of this. It's definitely take to, um, it's definitely taken a lot of practice. Um, I, I definitely have, uh, used to get my nerves all worked up and I would get very overwhelmed and I would start overthinking everything. But over the years, I've 
I've really learned to just kind of focus on one thing at a time. Um, focus a lot on my breathing because that will keep your heart rate low and keep you kind of keep your mind clear. Um, so kind of going in like either in the ready room and behind the blocks, I think uh, for me, it's really important to kind of keep just a clear mind and just kind of focus on the one goal that I'm trying to focus or the one goal that I'm trying to complete right now. And it's just to swim, um, show everybody what I've been working on and swim my hardest and race everybody around me. I think, I think coming in, um, obviously I know that I was one of the younger swimmers in the field. And I mean, for the 400 I am, it's such an experienced field and a lot of people don't kind of peak until they're at an older age. So you, you really can't, um, like you can't, um, or you, you don't know what to expect, uh, for that event because there are so many people at, at so many different levels. And so, um, I knew going in that people like Katinka and, um, so many other very experienced swimmers in that, I really just wanted to kind of learn from them and kind of just embrace the whole time that I'm swimming in the same pool as them, because I do know how um, decorated they are and talented they are. So kind of taking everything um, away and like learning on how they swim will definitely, I, I mean, I want to use that to better myself. Um, also, I was just excited. I mean, this was my first ISL. I definitely wanted to show the world what I can do and what I was training on. Um, I got, I told myself, like, I got a spot on an ISL team. So I definitely want to see how fast I can go and how many points I can score for my team. So I think um, just getting excited and but also keeping a very calm mind um, for these longer, tougher events, I think is something that really helps me when I go up against a very experienced field. And is there anything you can kind of pinpoint out something, something most important you picked up from this ISL season from the more experienced swimmers? Um, I mean, yeah, I think the main thing that I kind of picked up between everyone, not just from my event, but um, from a lot of the more older experienced swimmers in any event, it's how they um walk away from their event and whether it was a really good swim or a not so great swim they kind of take everything and they acknowledge what just happened and go straight to recovery and preparing for their next event i think that's really important um i think for longer swims especially it takes um in some way a different toll on your body <laughs> um and so i think just not getting caught up in the moment and focusing on the job that you have to do. I think it was really inspiring and it kind of helped me stay calm because everyone is in the same boat. Everyone was swimming a bunch of different events um, back to back. So it was really cool to kind of see how everyone handled everything differently. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Louise, um, I wanted to talk to you about the 100 meters individual medley. First of all, um, have you done this event before the ISL much at all? Uh, I think the last time I did it before ISL was at European 2015 in Netanya. So it, it was a while. <laughs> uh, I have done it a couple of times. It's a fun event, but my breaststroke wasn't really up to date. <laughs> Not the stroke that I've put a lot of focus in and practice in the last year. Um, and with like the quick turnaround between the strokes, it didn't really feel like I had the time to get into it. The rhythm, like not just breaststroke, just any stroke. Um, it's definitely an event I want to improve on for next season. And I, I train back Y and three pretty much every day. So like, I just need to get that breaststroke together and like work on the transitions, I think. So it's, it's, it's the breaststroke that you're going to be working on. To, to, yeah. To sort of... <laughs> And Luis, Anton, I wanted to ask this question to you. I had a discussion with a bunch of coaches um, a couple of days ago for a match analysis, and they voiced an opinion that for a breaststroker, especially short course, um, if you're a butterfly or a freestyler, your pullouts are significantly better than um, your typical breaststroker. And they believe that the you know, for the 100 meters individual medley, if, if you don't have the best breaststroke, which is kind of a cliche thing to say, but you have to make your pull down if you're a butterfly, freestyle, or backstroker. 
as far as possible because this is where you win in terms of your um, typical um, person who focuses on breaststroke and does the individual medley events. Anton, Luis, would you, would you agree to this? Anton, you as a breaststroker, um, Luis, you as a person that does butterfly, freestyle, a little bit of backstroke and also does breaststroke? I, my sister is a breaststroker. I, it was a while ago since we trained together, but I did notice when it came, like the few times that we have some breaststroke against each other, um, I do follow her in the pullout pretty decently. It's when the breaststroke swimming starts, she just pulls away. So yeah, I, I can see how that is correct. <laughs> Yeah I, yeah, I agree. And I mean, even for myself, the pullout is something that I'm trying to focus on every day in practice. Um, just, you know, leverage the speed that we have off the wall. And so without doubt, it's, uh, it's definitely an un underrated, I guess, uh, part of the stroke. Thank you. And guys, before we get into the blitz, which is ahead of us, there's one more fan question I thought this was very interesting and it's addressed to all of you. It goes, are you happy because you win or do you win because you're happy? Tessa, do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is kind of funny. I, I definitely had, um, like I kind of mentioned before, when I was younger, I would get very nervous. Um, and it would kind of like throw me off. My head would be all over the place and it would throw me off like even before I would jump in the water and swim. And sometimes when your mind is scattered and you, you're not really focused, you don't have the best swim. And so um, that, I mean, for when I'm not, or when my brain is kind of scattered, I'm not necessarily like happy. And so those are the times where my swims are kind of off. Lately, I've been really, um, just trying to have fun with everything. Like we're in this sport because we love to swim and we're in this sport because we love the people that we train with. And so if you can just kind of embrace everything that you love and kind of learn from everything um, and just be excited to race. I know it's, it's kind of funny. I always think back, like when you're 10 years old, you're always excited to jump in the water because you, there's always going to be something new. Um, and then when you get older, sometimes you, kind of lose that fun and you're very focused on like splits and numbers and everything that you have to do. Um, and then that's kind of where people get, have a little bit of trouble um, going best times or like kind of keeping their focus. And so I think if you can get back to that point where you're just there to have fun, um, we're here because we love it. That's when you swim the fastest, the happy swimmer is a fast swimmer. And and then once you win, or if you win while swimming happy, that just is, makes it even more special. So it's definitely- Boosts the happiness, okay. Yeah, happiness is key to a fast swimmer. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tessa. Luis, what about you? Uh, do you agree with Tessa? I, I believe, and Tessa, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're leaning more towards a happy swimmer as a fast swimmer. So you win because you're happy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I agree with her. I definitely think it's a combination. It's fun to win, but I do think going in with a positive attitude and a positive mindset and just having fun with it is super important. And I agree, like the best races, like I've been relaxed, I'm excited and I'm having fun. Like I'm in the sport because I love it and I'm surrounded by people that I want to be around. So I agree. Having a happy mind and happy thoughts and just being positive definitely help you get to win and <laughs> yeah yeah okay thank you thank you Luis. Anton what about you yeah it's uh it's without doubt um I win because I'm happy and unfortunately it's taken me a, a long time to come to understand that um often placing way much uh, emphasis on you know, my rankings or uh, where I end up instead of appreciating and, you know, realizing that it's all about, you know, your journey and, you know, your process to get there. And uh, the journey doesn't stop with a single individual win or, or some medal. There's always going to be something, you know, just I think as individuals who want to succeed, we're never going to be um, contempt or uh, happy with like one single thing and like, oh, that's it. Now we're done. No, there's always going to be the next thing that comes. It's a uh, relentless pursuit for uh, excellence. And so, you know, have, putting the focus on 
you know, your journey um, and exactly recognizing that your happiness comes from that journey and not from the, from that singular win that you're focusing on. Um, that's when you do allow yourself to perform the best, like uh, Tess and uh, Louisa said. And, you know, that really creates that positive feedback loop because, you know, you are happy and you focus on, you know, being happy through your, through your journey. And then you have those uh, good performances. Whereas if you'd be happy because you win, then you're setting yourself up for failure as soon as you don't win. Because then that automatically means you didn't succeed. And so I think the def definition of success can't only be tied to uh, some placement. Tessa, you also mentioned that um, you tend to swim better when your mind is focused. I heard a lot of swimmers say that, um, and athletes in general, they tend to do better when they have a lot of things on mind, when they have other stuff to worry about and they don't focus on, on the thing they're doing that much and their performance seems to go up and up and up from, from this not seemingly not caring as much. Do you see the benefit in that also? I can see, I can see both ways, honestly. And I've been in positions where either one has benefited, benefited me. Um, I think it's just important to see and to um, try out what works best for you. I know for me, I like to just keep a calm mind by I, talking to the person that I'm sitting next in the ready room or kind of um, just like, looking back on all the hard training that I've been doing and kind of like, okay, like um, I can't do anything right now that'll make me any better. So let's just go see what happens with what I've done um, previously. Um, I know a lot of people like, like to listen to music or like completely distract themselves. Um, personally, I, I like just like getting in the zone, um, they like going over my race and visualizing it in my head maybe once or twice. And then after that, kind of letting it go because there's nothing else that I can do that will kind of change the result. So just getting excited and getting, um, just kind of like knowing that you're gonna own whatever you're gonna do in the race. That That's what gets me excited and that's what gets me kind of motivated to swim well. Thank you, thank you, Tessa. And guys, if you don't mind, let's, let's move to the blitz. Um, so here's how it's going to work. Um, there is a compilation of questions from the fans that don't require a sophisticated answer. Uh, in general, it, it's it's okay of a simple yes, no, or a, or a simple, I don't know, a sentence answer. Um, and let's do it in the following manner. Um, we'll go Luis to Tessa to Anton, if you guys are okay with it. All right, let's get started then. Luis, do you have a pet? No. Tessa? Yes. Yeah. I too. Well, what is it? Um, a dog and a cat. <laughs> Do they distract you from from the from your swimming routines a little bit? Oh no, they're they're, they're good to relax on weekends with. <laughs> okay, Anton, what about you? Oh no. Okay, thank you. Louise, how much on average do you train a day in terms of yardage? Oh wow. Uh I actually have to say that I usually don't count how much I've done. Uh, so I would say a session is around 5K, but usually I don't really count how long they are. Wow, that's mind boggling. I, uh, you're actually not the first uh, swimmer that says that you're the second, but I, I can't remember right now who said it the first, but it, it, I, it's almost unbelievable to me. I used to count every single meter I swam. How, why don't you count? It was just like at SC, like Dave, kind of wrote the sessions as we were in the water so we never knew the next set so we didn't really know how long the session was going to be and I just didn't keep up on how much we swam and now when I moved here I actually know in advance how long the sessions are but that's necessarily not something I look at. Interesting. Okay thank you Louise. Tessa what about you? How much do you swim on average? Um, um, when I was at school, when I was doing doubles and kind of like a normal schedule, I would, um, each session would be probably between five and seven K. Um, I even four, if we were doing like kind of drills and like technique work. So kind of somewhere in that range right now, um, being home, our pool schedules is a bit, um, different. There's very limited pools time that we can swim at. So, Currently, I'm just doing singles, but they're three hours long. Um, 
So it is kind of a big difference to what I was doing before, but usually we swim between like eight and 11 K. Um, so it kind of, honestly, the three hour practices are kind of similar to having a double day, um, kind of the same total yardage, but yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing. Thank you, Tessa. Anton, what about you? Yeah, during days with doubles, it's anywhere from, you know, seven to 10 K then. And then on singles, it's just, uh, you know, usually a five K. Are you one of these people that mainly do breaststroke in, in practice or you do mix in a lot of freestyle? I am. Yeah, when it's uh, main stroke, it's, uh, it's breaststroke only. All right, thank you. Um, next question is how many hours on average do you spend on swimming related activities a week? I know this is a hard question, but what I'm referring to is um, swimming, hitting the gym and doing physio. Uh, three, three oh, components wow. on this. See how much that is. Easy answer when, when you're in college, right? It's always under 30 hours. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> no, in, in college, it was like we never over, right, like went over the limit. Um, it's hard to say because, like, I don't really count the hours where I'm home, especially informally. Like, I don't really count them, but yeah. Uh, I don't even know. <laughs> Fair enough. 30-ish. 30-ish. <laughs> we'll take it. Tessa, what about you? Um, yeah, I would say with a normal schedule um, between swim practices and weightlifting sessions and dry land, I would say that's about 20 hours a week. And then any kind of other like physio or like rehab, that's just anything on top of that. So um, I'd say between 20 and 25 hours a week. Thank you, Tessa. Anton, what about you? I think it's a uh, full-time 40-hour work week if I count my naps. Uh, it's definitely part of your swimming performance. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, recovery. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's the same with the as the girls, roughly the same. same okay. yeah. Got it, thank you. What is your personal preference? Long course meters, short course meters, or yards? Uh, long course. Huh? Yeah, long course as well. And Tom? Uh, I'm gonna have to go with short course for right now, uh, since that's where I had my best recent meets. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had a you know amazing long course meet in a while, so uh, you know, hopefully, it all changes this summer. Long, uh, short course meters or short course yards? Uh, meters. Meters. Have you done a lot of yards in general? Yeah, so when I swim in college, uh, obviously a lot of yards, but uh, I think meters is the appropriate distance. Got it. Thank you. Um, what is your personal preference in terms of events? What is your favorite event to swim? And what is your favorite event to spectate? Favorite to swim, 100 fly. Um, and to look at probably the 100 free. Tessa? Um, my favorite event to swim changes every single day. I think on some days, I think when I'm trying to have um, fun and see what I can do, honestly, I really enjoy swimming the 200 breast. Um, it's not something that I did at ISL, but it's definitely a fun event for me. Um, and personally to watch, definitely the 400 IM, just because I know exactly what they're going through. And so it's really cool to see somebody do well, because I know just how hard that they had to work for that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, thank you, Tessa. Anton, what about you? Yeah, for me, it's the 200 breast, uh, for sure, for racing. Um, it's just like, I, I feel like it's the event where I can, you know, incorporate a lot of tactics into. Obviously, you can do it in the 100 too, like, you know, guard hard and um, and then hold or, you know, come back stronger. But in the 200, I feel like you have uh, ample time to really apply those strategies. Uh, and then watching, um, having that, I think I can, some of the most fun races I've ever watched, uh, I think I forget which men's NCAA it was, I think it was in 2016, but there was like four guys in the mile that were just going out of the entire time. Uh, and so having a tense race for that long, I think that's, you know, one of the most exciting things I've ever seen. 
Uh, Anton, I totally agree with you. Seeing a head-to-head -head, um, race in the mile is, is an absolute spectacle. I don't know why people deem it, um, I don't know, not that interesting as other events. By the way, if, if you were to choose your talent, Anton, um, would, you, would you want to be a long-distance swimmer? You'll have the ability to strategize all you want. I used to be a distance swimmer. Those are the events that I swam at the uh, London Olympic side, the uh, 4 a.m. And the, and the mile. There you go. Okay, now I see the love for strategizing. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Thank you, Anton. Um, next question is, how old were you when you started swimming? I basically grew up at the pool. <laughs> my, my dad is a coach, so I was always on pool side. Officially, I think I started competing when I was like around 11, maybe. Okay. But you were always around. Uh, yeah, it's like basically in the water since age of one. <laughs> oh, interesting. Babies, when they're born, have the ability to swim. And later on, they kind of lose it a little bit. Are you one of these people that never lost the ability just out of pure interest? <laughs> or you didn't know? Actually, I was the kid that was screaming in the water like during swim lessons. I only wanted to be there with my parents when I was really young <laughs> and I wanted to play and not swim. <laughs> but I've always enjoyed the water. I can't blame you for this. <laughs> I think most of us would enjoy playing in the water a little more than the tedious laps. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Tessa, what about you? Um, when did you start swimming? Um, I started swimming, I think, when I was around seven years old. Um, I have an older sister and she started swimming before me and so kind of like Louise I was just being dragged to the pool to watch like with my parents and I was like they thought like if I'm gonna be here why not swim myself so that's kind of how I got in I think um, I competitively I started actually competing at like 10 so um, kind of yeah around that age. Were you a IMF straight away? Honestly, I have kind of changed my best event, like my whole swim career. Um, I used to swim a lot of distance events um, and that's kind of how I got my like background in swimming. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always loved to try new events and train all of the events. I really like training everything. And so I kind of dabbled in everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Anton, what about you? When did you start? Yeah, I grew up with the pool as well. Uh, my parents always used to go to work to the pool and I would, you know, join them along. Uh, and I think I started taking lessons when I was around like five years old, something like that, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question, um, did you have a childhood idol? And if you did, who was it? Uh, so I grew up with watching Tres all summer and Sarah Shestrom as well. Like <laughs> she broke through when she was like 15 and I was like, well, so obviously both of them have been big inspiration for me, both being Swedish and both being flyers. Thank you, thank you, Louise. Tessa, what about you? Um, yeah, I think definitely, I never really had like one person that I would look up to. I kind of would look at everybody who's on either the national team or like Olympic team. Um, but I think, um, when I was younger, I, that's kind of when Missy Franklin was at her peak. And so I really enjoyed like watching her swim and kind of seeing how she would do everything. So I would say her. Sure. Missy Franklin, by the way, is a huge inspiration in swimming for me as well. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be her training partner for a year at Cal. And there, okay. there, there is no better swimmer to, to do a hard set next to. She, she's yeah. very supportive all the time, very positive, yes. I agree. I agree with Missy Franklin. <laughs> Thank you, Tessa. And Anton, uh, what about you? Did you have a childhood idol? And uh, who was it? Yeah, so when I was growing up um, as, a, as a young swimmer, uh, the best swimmer in Iceland, uh, his name is Ar Arnason, uh, and his best, uh, I think, placement in the Olympics was fourth in, I want to say Sydney, in Tuna Backstroke. So that was sort of, you know, if he can do it, I can probably get there one day. And so, um, and I think it's also pretty cool to have, you know, some of the Obviously, I you know follow all the badass swimmers uh, around the time when I was you know growing up and getting more into swimming. And so it was really cool to have one of them on our on our team, Brent Hayden. So, <laughs> oh yeah, Brent Hayden is, is yeah. a highlight. By the way, I was I was I was so heartbroken that he didn't swim more, and he was swimming so well in every single event you guys put him in. I, I wish he did a little bit more of individual events. Maybe next season. 
We'll see you next season. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Um, second to last question. Um, what is your favorite sport to spectate and your favorite sport to participate in counting out swimming? Um, I really like watching track, uh, track and field and just in general, um, and cross-country skiing. Um, those are two that I would spectate. And I would actually say that playing-wise, I would probably like to be a track doing something within track and field. I did go to it for like four or five years growing up. So I think it's a lot of fun. Track is quite a diverse sport. Is there any specific event you, you like more? I, <laughs> I did try almost all of them because it was some knee problems and I was growing a lot. So running wasn't my thing, but I would say high jump was my favorite out of all of them. But I did try a fair bunch of them and it was fun. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Tessa, what about you? Um, to watch, I really enjoy watching gymnastics. I think it's like I have never been able to do those things. So um, it's you're talking about cool. the sport gymnastics, not the rhythmic gymnastics, right? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean, all kind of gymnastics. I've definitely been envious of everything that they've been able to do. Um, to participate in, I. I've tried a bunch of different sports. I used to do cross country running. Um, I definitely don't do that anymore, but I think kind of anything like, <laughs> I don't really know. Um, I would say I like biking or skiing is definitely a fun one for me. Fair enough. You, you don't like to go too far away from swimming, something, something long, something more, um, that has cycles repetitive. <laughs> yeah, I okay. guess. Fair enough. Thank you, Tessa. Anton, what about you? Uh, I really like watching American football. Uh, it's just, you know, the cost and the action aspect of it is really fun. Uh, and then recently I've been getting really into watching indoor cycling on YouTube. Like it's like the uh, elimination races. They're very, very intense. Highly recommend everyone to watch those. Um, <laughs> thing is called Opium. I think, think that, that's what it's called. Uh, and then what I would do if I wouldn't be a swimmer, uh, the sport that I had to choose between uh, when I was growing up in Iceland is uh, handball and swimming. And so I guess I would want to see where I'd end up in, in my handball career. Uh, it's sort of the national sport in, in Iceland. So always fun to watch as well. You have a lot of common with for humanity then. <laughs> I wouldn't be at his caliber in handball for sure. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's fun to watch. Thank you, Anton. And by the way, is there any specific team in American football you support? Mm, not really. It's just a, you know, fun to spectate. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Our conclusive question for this podcast. What is your favorite team logo and team uniform? Counting out your own. We're talking about um, ISL. Yeah. <laughs> um, favorite logo. Um trying to think of all of them. I do like London Roars. I think that's a uh, good one. The Lions, and yeah. Was it close, that one? Or oh, no, no, just the Lions of the oh, London Roar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what about the uniform, London Roar as well? Like the uniform that we all had in colors or yeah. like their team? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> At least we look good together as a team in those colors. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you, Louise. Essa, what about you? Um, other than our logo, I actually really liked um, the Tokyo logo. I think it was really cute with the little frog and everything. Um, and I actually really liked their kind of bright green um, jumpsuits that they got. They really stood out on deck. And I think that, would, that was probably really good for them to do for TV and broadcasting and everything. So I, I thought they had a really good color coordination going on their signature move goes so well with this uniform the, yeah. the tokyo hop oh, yeah it's amazing <laughs> thank you tessa anton what about you i 100 percent agree with tessa that's uh without doubt the best logo in the in the league and and uniform i agree with you upon this that the logo of the tokyo frog being said frog is oh, it's it's outstanding but guys thank you so much this about concludes our podcast and from the, from all the fans, thank you so much for joining us. And um, before I let you go, is there any final words you would like to say to the Toronto Titan fans? Um, Anton, you want to start? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, if you tuned in, uh, thank you so much for uh, listening and uh, thank you for being, you know, Titans fans. We're definitely going to be a growing team. And so be without doubt, appreciate your support and look forward to making a splash in the pool for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Tessa? Yeah, again, thank you so much for having us and thank you to everyone listening. Um, I think the Titans definitely are going to make a bigger impact than they did next season. So we're really excited and hope that everyone gets excited for us back home. So, yeah. Thanks, Tessa. Louise? Yeah, thank you for having us and listening to us and asking us the questions. And yeah, excited for next season and Hopefully we'll be able to put up a great show for all the fans next season again. Thank you so much, Louise. And thank you to all of you. And to everyone listening, our next podcast takes place this Friday and our next match analysis takes place this upcoming Sunday. It's the match analysis of semifinal two. You guys participated in this. Um, everyone should tune in and watch. Um, and thank you, for, thank you for joining us. Have an amazing evening. Thank you. Guys, with this being said, we're no longer...